<laughs> Thank you everybody very much for your nice words on Crash Bash. Be sure to leave more nice words to be featured in the next video, hopefully not in two months from now again. And of course, I'd like to especially extend my gratitude to my patrons Dauber underscore, Stan, Dano, Dotman, and Jesse. I don't ever really do this, but it's the last video of the year and the end of an incredible year on YouTube at that. So let's end it with one more banger. Let's go for 50 likes. Enough dillo dallying. Let's get into the video. I think we can all agree that Crash hasn't had the best go of it since his departure from the doghouse. We've had some pretty good stuff, arguably some flashes of brilliance, and then we've had... Bring it! To see my favorite franchise die the slow, horrible death it did was heartbreaking, to say the least. So when Crash rose from the ashes at E3 2016 with the announcement of HD remakes of the original trilogy I grew up with, I was ecstatic. Following the immense success of the Insane trilogy, it was only a matter of time before we got our long-awaited brand new Crash game. And it is finally upon us. Crash Bandicoot, let's ignore the GOOD Crash 4, I guess! Crash Bandicoot 4. It's about time? You're goddamn right. Once you're done reading Embryo's Bible, you get to choose your playstyle. Retro mode where there's still a life system like the old days, or you can go with the modern mode where lives don't exist and you get to die as many times as you want without suffering major setbacks, which you should definitely pick on your first playthrough. As this is appropriately titled Crash Manicoot 4, this is of course a direct sequel to the end of Crash 3 where the dastardly bastards got turned into toddlers. But here we are decades later and they're all grown up. After 22 stinking years! They finally escape their interdimensional prison, leaving Uka Uka to die. We then cut to present day with Aku Aku sensing a great power, and he wakes up Crash so they can head off to Insanity Peak to investigate the source. Right off the bat, I gotta say, the art style and animation is... INCREDIBLE <laughs> The characters are so full of life and ooze so much personality through their bouncy, fluid animation and expressions. Just look at this dumbass, he's never been so adorable. Not to mention his back, I know he's always been a bit wide, but good lord, he's built like an oak tree. While much has changed, plenty has also stayed the same. Crash 4 remains faithful to the linear hallway design we've come to know and love from the original trilogy, only this time on a much grander, denser, detailed, and varied scale. However, instead of hopping from world to world through warp rooms, it's back to the basics with the map level structure from Crash 1, which you may remember being tedious to navigate, but now they've given you a level select screen on the menu so you don't have to literally travel across dimensions just to change levels. Before I jump into the gameplay, just like the Insane Trilogy, you can play as Crash or Coco on just about every level, but for simplicity's sake, when I'm talking about those levels, I'll just say Crash since that's who I played as. Crash is of course back with his slides, spins, and slams, but he now also has the double jump right at the start of the game. Not to mention Crash has some brand new abilities right off the bat as well, as he can now wall run, rail grind, and swing. The swinging's pretty neat, the rail grinding's pretty fun, and sometimes the wall running was fun, but other times it can suck an egg. Why do I keep dying? And unlike Crash 3, where you receive power-ups for defeating bosses, this time you discover quantum masks at the end of certain levels, which inherit special abilities. The first mask, Lonnie Loli, aka Lonnie Billy, and fix this before some can phase objects and platforms in and out of reality. Combining this ability with the wall running is a nice added layer, but where it really shines is with the rail grinding segments, as you're already having to switch up and down and swing side to side, so having to focus on when to switch things in and out as well really puts my brain on the fret. The second mask, Akano, the quantum mask of dark matter, can use a buffed up death. tornado spin to glide from platform to platform, bonk enemies and projectiles, and can even shred reinforced crates with ease. Then we have Kapunawa, who can slow down time, making it easier for you to evade enemies and traverse hazards. Oh, you're a dick. You can even safely detonate nitro if you're quick enough. Great, here we go, already ruining things the previous games did better. And finally, we've got Ika Ika, who can flip the center of gravity on a whim. They're all incredibly fun additions to the game, both as extra layers to the gameplay, as well as individual characters. The way they're integrated into the platforming, especially towards the end of the game, jumbling using their abilities one after the next, makes for some mind-boggling, tight, and intense sequences that dwarf the difficulty of Stormy Ascent tenfold. If you have a lot of trouble with the Insane Trilogy, then I'd advise you stay far away from this. I've been playing Crash ever since I was a chubby little bastard, so I know many of the games like the back of my hand, but this game took my hand, shit in it, and slapped me in the face with it. It is filled to the brim with brilliant, split-second decision-making gameplay, sure to produce lots and lots of death. And unlike the days of old, no crystals to be found. This time for collectibles, we've got gems, 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 
and more gems! That's a lot of gems! Yeah, so in Crash 4, you now get three gems for collecting certain percentages of Wumpa, which now gravitate toward you instead of being able to be spun away. Thank you. As usual, you of course get a gem for breaking all the boxes in a stage, but you also get gems for completing a level without dying more than three times, and there are hidden gems to be found as well. And there are four colored gems to be found throughout the game, which I gotta say were really well hidden without being too obscure, as you can spot hints for obtaining them if you have a good eye for them. Getting the green gem was my favorite because you get to do your best Houston Astros impression. But God be damned the blue gem. Good lord the blue gem. The stress of getting this thing literally broke Crash. He's a frog now. The developers must have really loved Crash 2, and I'm all for that because that means a heck of a lot less vehicles. But that also means they loved hitting no boxes like you had to for this gem in Cortex Strikes Back. The difference here though is that that was the first level of Crash 2. This level is like halfway through the game, and you have to use the mass power that destroys everything in its path to navigate your way up the towers. Meaning you have to perfectly time switching your spin on and off right before you bash into some crates. And you have to be mindful of which enemies you kill because sometimes they'll spiral off and break other crates in the distance. This took me over two hours to complete and then an even bigger kick in the dick was when I realized you could have used a bonus as a makeshift checkpoint because obviously you can't break checkpoint crap! The pain doesn't stop there, kids, because these levels, as I said, are a hell of a lot bigger, which means a hell of a lot more crates. And I mean a hell of a lot more. And that's not the end of the problem. Do you remember Cold Hard Crash and how it had the most bullshit crate placement in the original trilogy with this one hanging off camera? Okay. Imagine that, but for like every level. I shouldn't have to be looking up guides for nearly a dozen levels just for crates. And just to be clear, that's not nostalgia clouding my judgment. I've gone over how absurdly obscure some of the secrets in Crash 2, but mainly three were. So it's not like they were perfect, but even those things like gateways to secret levels or paths to gems were easier to find than some of these fucking crates. What the fuck? And these levels aren't snack size like the old days. No, some of these levels are pretty big and no, that's not what she said. Thank you very much. So have fun because these levels will eat up a good chunk of your time, especially when going for every collectible. And that is also thanks in part to the bonus stages, which are redonkulous, but for good reason. They are extremely fun and challenging, featuring more complex puzzles than they've ever even come close to having before. There was plenty of cases where I spent more than half of my time in the levels trying to beat the bonuses rather than the levels themselves, and it was always all for nothing because I'd still come up short in the end. Continuing on with some really gamer epic platforming puzzles, I loved the flashback tapes. They might even be my favorite parts of the whole game. You obtain them through some of the levels if you reach a certain point without dying. They take you back to ye old 1996, a great bit of foreshadowing for the end of the game to experience Crash and Coco's training under Cortex before escaping his castle. Not only are they wonderful tests of skill, they even include classic Crash tunes from the original trilogy, which was a genius touch. But what's really cool is they also even delve further into the lore of Crash and Coco's origins, as well as the relationship between Cortex, Enbryo, and others, which is something I never knew how much I wanted until I got it. The tapes even shed some light on Crash's obsession with Wumpa Fruit, Enbryo's growing resentment for Cortex, and you even learn Crash's birthday and his real name. Crashworth Cortex the first. This is great and all, but the one question I really need answered that they didn't is why is there a sea of sheep? I bet you thought that was it for collectibles, but you'd be dead wrong. We've still got all the skins to unlock, which you win by earning a certain amount of gems per level you complete. And good God, the names on these things. Big Horn Energy, Booty Seeker, 360 No Scope. We've also got the insanely perfect relics, which you win if you can beat the level in classic Crash 1 fashion by breaking all the boxes without dying once. It was hard enough making it halfway through some levels without dying just to snatch the flashback tape, so to break every box without dying as well is going to be so fun. Can you tell I'm excited? Did I mention if you want to 100% this game that you have to get all the gems twice? What? That's right, because now there is an inverted mode where you play through each level mirrored with minor box and hidden gem placement alterations and with a special filter, like a mode where you color the world's blank canvas in a paint much like the blob, an underwater alteration which also slows gameplay speed in half, an old-timey film filter which speeds up gameplay a tad, and even a retro arcade mode. I think most of the filters are really cool while others just burned my retinas. And on top of that, you could argue it's repetitive, but the visual changes are enough to keep my attention personally because I'm a corporate lackey. But instead of repetitive, how about something we've never done before? You can fucking play as Dingo Dial. Yes, baby, it's time to make toast! Oh. 
Never mind, I guess in this age of sanitization, Dingo Doll decided to switch out his flamethrower for a vacuum. But who cares? Get to play as Dingo Dial. So good old Dingy's been enjoying the retired life from villainy while running his own food joint, Dingo's Diner. He sees some henchmen of Papa Batfield, who Dingo roasted in the ad for his diner carrying TNT into it, and heads off to stop the sabotage. Dingo Doll can jump and spin just like Crash, but his specialty is using his big suck to destroy crates, snag TNT and use them as projectiles, and can even use his hoover to hover across gaps. I thought Dingo Doll's sections were a ton of fun, just like our second new playable character, Tana. After being strung up by some booty seekers, Tana from another dimension jumps in to make the rescue. She also can jump and spin like Crash, but rather than using his patented belly slam, she just fists the ground in a very similar fashion to Coco's Smash and Wrath of Cortex. And interestingly enough, she also uses a hook to break boxes and grab onto certain ledges and whatnot, much like Nina from Crash to Insanity. And she can also do a wall jump like Ratchet and Clank. She is an absolute boatload of fun to play as. After saving the duo from captivity, Tana basically lets on the Crash and Coco croaked in her world, so she'll help in her own way wherever she can to prevent that from happening in this one. And last, but certainly not least, Okay, he's actually absolutely loose. We have Cortex as a new playable character as well. Equipped with this hairdryer, Cortex can morph enemies into stone platforms or gelatinous ones, which you can use for some big old bounces. I don't think he's bad at all. He's still very fun. Just thought he was the weakest of the new play styles. If I could critique one thing though, it's that I wish he had some sort of lock on for his blaster. But regardless, yeah, all these new play styles are fun and in their own way. Dingo Dolls for blowing shit up. Tawn is very fast paced and acrobatic and Cortex is methodical and puzzle based. However, and this is a big however, many times when you play as these characters, you are playing from a different point of view of a level you already played through as Crash to explain why something happened to Crash in that specific level. Sounds pretty cool, right? <laughs> Because once you're done that character section of the level, it then flips back to Crash and you have to play the other half of the level you just finished with slight changes. This is as padding as padding gets, plain and simple. Either make these side characters levels longer or simply end them at the point where they affect Crash's timeline. One of the levels infamous for doing this is Building Bridges featuring the return of our boy Polar. While the carcass of the Crash 1 hog continues to be left to rot. And his controls are stiffer than a teen who just went incognito. Tight controls and even tight Tighter hitboxes on the boxes makes getting the gems here a task from Uka Uka beyond the grave. But of course, you already had to do this section in the level bears repeating, and now here we are on building bridges doing the same shit but even harder. Things do get a bit better when we meet our little space blob here. I think if you're just playing through these areas casually, you'll have a lot of fun, but if you're going for all the crates as well, then I'd make sure you have ibuprofen on deck. On the bright side, these sections, especially polars, come packed with some absolutely banging tunes. On the subject, the music in Crash 4 is pretty solid. It has some rockers for sure, but I wouldn't put it above Crash 1, 2, 3, CTR, Bash, Wrath of Cortex, I haven't played Nitro Kart, so I can't say. Twin Sanity, look, I know when I put it that way, it sounds bad, but Crash just has phenomenal music across the board. Speaking of boards, Crash 4 brings back one of the best vehicles from the whole series, the Jet Board. I missed this thing, man. It was awesome to use in Crash 2, so I'm really happy they decided to bring it back, even though the turning makes me want to scream. And they even brought back the one one thing everybody liked from the true Crash 4. The Atlasphere. Although it was only here for this little chase sequence, it was the best part of the game. 15 out of fucking 10. And while Crash Bandicoot has never been telling 15 out of 10 stories, this one's better than most, if not all it's told before. So as I said, Aku Aku's feeling some bad juju, so he and Crash go to investigate. Crash reaches Insanity Peak, where he comes across Lonnie Loli, and after escaping from, I assume, some guardian of the mass, the two meet up with Coco and Aku Aku, where they discover a quantum rift, which Coco says is basically a door between dimensions. Lonnie Loli explains that they need to find his siblings so they can shut the rifts across the universe. Meanwhile, Cortex gives absolutely no shits anymore. The guy just wants to retire to some beach after having his pride plowed by Crash time and time again. So he sends off Engine and Embryo to deal with the Bandicoots while Entropy works on a rift generator. In search of Akano, the first dimension we venture to is the Hazardous Waste, set in 2084, where we... What do you mean it's not finished and stuck? So we're halted by Engine, who very politely offers us a backstage pass to his rock show. You know, he seems like a stand-up guy if you can look past the rocket in his- ah! 
Engine's boss battle here, as usual, is wonderful. It starts off with these dudes running at you who you have to spin back to destroy Engine's speakers. Then you have to climb up Engine's drums and smash his robot. Then for the next two waves, you have to do the same thing while also trying to avoid discs being shot from the speakers and climb up to smack his robot again with the help of Lonnie Lowly. For the final round, you have to once again avoid the discs while jumping from the moving platforms to whack the dudes into him, climb up, yada yada, and you win. <laughs> this was a really solid first boss. It's funny to think how far we've come since the Papu Papu days. Unfortunately, after the battle, Akano, who was in Engine's possession, falls through another rift by bouncing off Engine's skull. This guy is made of dark matter. How does that not fucking kill Engine? Nonetheless, Salty Wharf, Wharf, Barf, Barf. <laughs> 1717 is our next destination. This is of course where we meet the new Tana and also where we finally meet up with- oh, shit! Wow, I was not expecting this. A mini boss named- Louise. So using your gamer epic jet board, you have to lure these explosive pie rats into Louise's tentacles. You do that for three rounds and yeah, this was a cool little surprise. What the fuck? So then we meet up with the Dark Matter Man himself and head off to Tranquility Falls based in 1402, where we face off against Embryo in a reimagined battle of his fight from Crash 1. He starts off by throwing these purple potions, which send off shockwaves for you to jump over, and then sends out these slime balls to deck right back at him a few times. Then he turns on Minecraft's super secret settings, and you just have to do that again. He then hooks up, and you just have to run for your life before Akano swoops in to help you push him off the platform. Do that three times, and victory is yours. This was a fantastic evolution of his first boss battle all those years ago. And it was really nice to see Enbryo get some spotlight in a Crash game again, as I think he's one of the more fascinating antagonists the series has. And the cutscene afterwards is also fascinating. For my final Whoa. test, taste my reptilian wrath. Uh, my colleague. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's get out of here. He did the crash one. That's so cool! Something also really cool is that this is where you unlock inverted mode, which of course featured in the fight, so it's like there's an in-universe reason as to why this mode exists, which they didn't have to do, so kudos for including that. Afterwards, we head off to Mosquito Marsh, set in a few days ago, in search of Kapunawa, and I gotta say, this place is home to not just my favorite level in the game, but possibly the entire Crash franchise. Off beat. This level just smacks you in the face, not with shit this time, but with its vigorous energy. Pumped up with phenomenal music, especially when it kicks into full gear on the rail grind sections. And it's easily one of the most creative environments ever seen in a Crash game. This level just completely enraptured me. It was incredible. And then Dillo dallying happened. At the end of this world, we discover Kapunawa and then head off to the 11th dimension where we take on Cortex. Wait, already? Uh, all right. Crash Bandicoot. It's about time. Fuck you. Here you can use Kapunawa's ability to slow down time. Starting off the fight on Cortex's blimp, he fires missiles from above. Then he sends out Punchbot Mark II, which you spin into him. Then he fires these discs and twisters at you until you spin another Punchbot at him. From here, it's just complete and utter chaos. Cortex is mashing all the buttons at once harder than I mashed your mom. I'm honestly surprised I didn't die once, because that was pretty damn intense. Afterwards, Entropy holographically scolds Cortex for being a bum. Honestly, I just feel bad bad for Cortex at this point. Entropy reveals that he's been in cahoots with a new villain to fulfill his diabolical plans, revealing that he seeks to erase every timeline in the multiverse and build a new one to his liking. Seeing as though the two sides now have a common enemy, Cortex decides to join forces with the Bandicoots to take down Entropy, but not before a father-son embrace. That's so precious. I also really like that Entropy is taking center stage as the main antagonist. It's something refreshing for the Crash series as it's been so long since we've had a villain who's just no nonsense. Plus, like Enbry I find him to be very intriguing and underutilized, so I'm really happy Crash 4's given them both some love. We then head to the Agapist Dimension, which is probably my personal favorite, where we find the fourth and final mask, Ika Ika. Then we venture off to Bermugula's orbit, where the gang meets up with Tauna and Dingo Dial. Here it's revealed that Entropy's been working with his female counterpart from Tauna's Dimension, and to quote that one fish from SpongeBob. <laughs> 
But hey, Oxide makes an appearance, so that's sweet. Eventually, we see Tana getting her asshole slammed by the two trophies before Coco and Co swoop in for the save, leading the two trophies to challenge them all to a fight. Before getting into the battle itself, we slide our way through various quantum rifts while collecting- I don't have anything to say. I am just still genuinely speechless that this is even here. I wonder what happens if you do it with Coco. Yeah. With the help of Akano and Kapunawa, you reach the Rift Generator and then use Iki Ika's powers to dodge the energy balls the trophies shoot at you as you destroy their security lasers. The male entropy pursues you while the female entropy then starts firing at you as you continue to destroy more of the security. The two then reverse roles as you go to disable even more of the security system and then... Oh! That's it, I guess. I gotta say, for what it's worth, the fight was pretty difficult, but still incredibly disappointing. The female trophy literally says, Let's see what you mongrels can do as a pack. As a pack. So why is this fight so short? Why is it just Crash or Coco? Where's Tana, Dingodal, Cortex? I guess they had a grander fight plan, but just ran out of time, which is really a shame because that would have been awesome. Kapunoa offers to take everybody to the culinary capital of the universe, Neon City. And at the end of it all, Cortex betrays the group by kidnapping and escaping with Kapunoa. Ah! As he leaves, all these crates start falling from his ship and Tana and Dingo boost Crash and Coco up to the crates so they can hop from one to the next and make their way aboard. Once they catch up with him, Cortex says he's going to put an end to this endless fighting once and for all by going back in time and stopping himself from ever trying to make Cortex the general of his animal army to begin with. This leads us back to Cortex Island in 1996 where it all began, and where we also see and hear some brilliant exchanges between present Cortex trying to convince past Cortex not to send Crash into the Vortex. What must I do to prove myself? Mother's name, Sharon. Childhood pet, cross with googly eyes. Favorite food, buttered noodles. Butter on the side. Embryo, change the password to my diary. This brute's been snooping. And at long last, it's all come down to this. The second fight against Cortex. The first round is very simple. It starts off with you taking out his Shudomatix, or turrets as I like to call them since I'm not a pretentious prick, and then having to spin his assistance into him. And this is how every round ends from here, because Cortex starts using the powers of the Quantum Mast against Crash, beginning with Lonnie Loli phasing out the floor. Next, Cortex fires lasers, then you have to jump and duck, and then does it again with the gravity inverted. Thirdly, he uses Kapunua to slow things down on and off, and last but not least, Akano is used to spin Cortex Cortex's contraption around as he fires lasers and turrets do their thing. You take out his assistance one last time and that does it. Afterwards, Cortex receives some Crash 1 karma, and then the past Cortex goes on to prepare past Crash for the Vortex, and we know how that goes. The Quantum siblings then banish Cortex to... That's, uh... That's dark. I really do just feel bad for Cortex at this point. Ah, he's at last. Hey, if he's happy, I'm happy. Good for him. After that, we see all the boys chilling at Crash's crib and are treated to probably the best credits in a video game with just this line alone. The events of this game are absolutely 100% canonical, unless you didn't like them, in that case it was all a dream. And finally, you unlock the Crash Dash. Uh, oh, never mind, the triple spin. Um, I guess that's a nice... Spin on thing. Shut the fuck up! Up. Well, what a wild ride that game was, huh? It's funny, I have such mixed feelings about Crash 4. On one hand, if I were to look at it casually, just running through the levels, breaking whatever boxes I could, not trying to do everything there is to do, then this is the best Crash Bandicoot game, and it's honestly not very close. I've been waiting so long to have a Crash game again that really pushes you and tests your skills, and this is it. This is the Crash Bandicoot game I've been waiting for for 22 years. I haven't even been alive that long! The art style and animation is fucking adorable. The music, while not the most memorable in isolation, has its standouts and overall fits the game very well and holds its own with all the other amazing Crash soundtracks. All the new playable characters are so, so fun. The flashback tapes were an absolute treat. Dingo Dial's amazing. Bastards. The skins were a nice touch. The bosses were probably the best bunch of any Crash game despite entropies being quite anticlimactic. Dingo Dial's flipping awesome. The platforming is very fresh, formidable, and multi-layered. Uh, what else? 
Dingo Dial? I could gush for hours about all this game did right. You can really feel how much love and passion Toys for Bob has for the franchise. But! And this is like... As big as Dingo Dial's butt. Ah, yummy! If you try to complete this 106%, collecting as many Wumpa as possible, breaking every crate, beat every level without dying more than three times, find the hidden gem, find the colored gems, get the perfect relic, get all the time trial relics, unlock all the skins, beat all the flashback tapes... Well... Let's just say I'd rather eat glass before I try to do any of that considering the bullshit hitboxes, bullshit box placement, and way too many of them to begin with. And I know they're called hidden gems for a reason, but like... What the fuck? But even outside of ridiculous completionist requirements, why are loading screens even a thing when you can die in the midst of a time trial and be sent back to the beginning no problem, but hit restart level and the game does its best Wrath of Cortex impression? This just bogs down the pace and further turns me from wanting to attempt completing the game. And again, why do we need to play practically the same level after completing a side character stage? And as much as the inverted levels are cool, why do we need to collect everything all over again? Why can't they just be a cool little bonus mode rather than another thing to add to a to-do list? I'm gonna complete this game all the way through someday, not because I think it'll be fun, but to say that I did it. And considering how wrong it feels of me not to complete the original trilogy 200% every time I play it, that tells me there's something wrong here. But again, if you were to do a casual playthrough not worrying about collectibles, then I would say this is easily the best Crash Bandicoot game. It earns the 4 in its title. I can say with absolute certainty that the Crash Bandicoot franchise is in great hands, and I can't wait to see where it goes from here.